Hi learners, I'm from Sano Nerds, and this video is on the pancreas, where we will learn about the anatomy, physiology, and normal ultrasound appearance. Now the pancreas is an incredibly important organ. It sits very central in the body, and it's surrounded by many key landmarks. It also has a dual function as an exocrine and endocrine organ. Due to its location though, it's a really hard organ to see by ultrasound, but we'll make sure to cover some tips to recognize the pancreas and how to image it. Section 5.1, Global Anatomy. The vascular landmarks around the pancreas are huge for recognizing the pancreatic tissue by ultrasound. You should be very familiar with the parts of the pancreas and how they are related to other midline structures. The pancreas starts to form at about week four and starts functioning at week 10. Now remember, we all start as tubes, and so the pancreas is going to arise from two buds off that duodenal portion of the embryonic tube. The dorsal bud is going to give rise to the neck, body, and tail of the pancreas, where the ventral bud gives rise to the head and uncinate process. Eventually, those buds should fuse together, creating the pancreas and the main pancreatic duct. The pancreas sits across the back of the abdomen behind the stomach, and the head of the pancreas is on the right side of the abdomen and is connected to the duodenum, which is the first section of the small intestines, through a small tube called the pancreatic duct. The more narrow end of the pancreas, called the tail, extends to the left side of the body near the spleen. It is essential for the sonographer to understand how the structures in the abdomen surround the pancreas. First, I'm gonna just give you kind of a summary of the relational anatomy, then we'll go into a little bit more detail for each section of the pancreas, and then we'll look at it again when we take a look at how the pancreas appears under ultrasound. In general though, the pancreas occupies the anterior perirenal space and lies obliquely between the C-loop of the duodenum and the splenic hilum. Posterior to the pancreas are the connective prevertebral tissues, the portal splenic confluence, superior mesenteric vessels, the aorta, inferior vena cava, and the lower border of the diaphragm. The stomach, duodenum, and transverse colon are going to form the superior and lateral borders of the pancreas. So in our image here, we can see that we have the pancreas this yellow kind of lumpy bumpy comma shaped structure. The head sits within the cradle of the C loop of the duodenum. The duodenum is the first part of the intestines right from the stomach. So we see that wrap around the pancreas head. The tail then extends more superiorly towards the hilum of the spleen. The tricky part about the pancreas though is that it does sit right behind or posterior to the stomach. And so we actually are kind of seeing the stomach being transparent in this image so we can see more of the pancreas, but you can kind of see the outline here. Everything that's this darker yellow is covered by the stomach, which makes it hard to see by ultrasound. Section 5.2, pancreas anatomy. The pancreas is divided into five main parts, the uncinate process, the head, neck, body, and tail. So again, we have our C-loop of our duodenum. The uncinate process is this little curly Q-tip of the pancreas, wrapping around to the head that sits in the cradle of the C-loop. The neck is another little tiny part next to the head, and then we have the body and tail. Let's take a look at each of these sections and talk about some of their landmarks. Starting with the uncinate process, the uncinate process again is a very small curved tip at the end of the head of the pancreas. The size of the uncinate process is going to vary from person to person. The major landmarks for the uncinate process are going to include the IVC posterior to it and the superior mesenteric vein anterior to it. So in other words, the uncinate process is kind of sandwiched between the IVC and the SMV. In our image here, we can see the IVC. We have the uncinate process just anterior to it, and then just anterior to the uncinate process, or the top of the sandwich, is the SMV here as it connects back to the portal confluence. Next up, we have the pancreas head. Now, due to the angle of the pancreas in the body, the head ends up being the most inferior portion of the gland because it sits at an oblique angle. The head is going to be surrounded by the C-loop of the duodenum, and although the head is usually a little bit easier to see by ultrasound, depending on how that duodenum is acting up, it can also make it kind of hard to see. A couple important things about the head of the pancreas. It is home to the common bile duct groove and the gastroduodenal artery, and it's also the most common place for pancreatic cancer to form. The head ends up being a very important area for the sonographer to evaluate for pathology and to use for finding other structures. 
When we're looking for the head on ultrasound, we are going to look for the IVC being posterior to it. We're going to see that the head is towards the patient's right of the portal confluence. The main portal vein and caudate lobe are going to be just superior to the head. And then we'll see the duodenum even further right into the body. So here's the head of the pancreas. We have the unsun process coming off of it. And you can see it's going to sit right in that C loop of the duodenum. You should be able to identify the gastroduodenal artery in the more anterior portion of it. And then we see the common bile duct groove in the more posterior portion of the pancreas head. Moving to the neck, the neck is located between the pancreatic head and body. And oftentimes the pancreatic neck is just going to be included as part of the body, but we do recognize that it has its own landmarks. So the neck is just this very small sliver of pancreas right here. The superior mesenteric vein is going to run posterior and inferior to it. So it comes up inferiorly and then kind of turns deep into the body running posteriorly to the portal confluence. We can also see then that the portal confluence is posterior to the neck as well. So here's that portal confluence where the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein join together. Again, that's just posterior to the pancreas neck. Moving down the pancreas then, we have the pancreatic body. Now the body is going to make up the largest portion of the pancreas, and the body is often the most difficult to see in its entirety due to its position posterior to the stomach. So this is all body here. Most of the pancreas is made up by the body, and most of that body sits right behind the stomach. So it is not uncommon to have to say pancreas area because the stomach or other bowel in the area is blocking our visualization of it. The landmarks that we'll use then to identify the body of the pancreas are going to include the aorta, celiac axis, left renal vein, adrenal gland, and kidney all sitting posterior to the body. So in this image, we have the aorta. We have the superior mesenteric artery coming off here. So that's kind of the start of the body. And then as we follow the body over, we'll find uh, the left renal vein running underneath it, the adrenal gland, and then the kidney is kind of right over here as well, sitting a little bit more medial into the body. So the body of the pancreas sits mostly from the aorta over to about the kidney, maybe just a little bit more medial to that. Some other structures that we'll see are the splenic artery running along the superior border of the body. So again, you can see the splenic artery coming off as the left branch of the celiac axis. It's a very tortuous vessel that runs on the superior side of the pancreas, coursing along the body, venture the tail, and into the spleen. Not so much a sonographic landmark, but definitely a landmark is the antrum of the stomach, and that's going to be anterior to it as well. So again, we have the stomach here. We have the fundus of the stomach, body of the stomach, and then the antrum is the part right before the pylorus muscle, and the pylorus muscle then connects into the duodenum. So the antrum is just that last little bit of stomach right before going into the small intestines. So that, again, is going to be the start of the body of the pancreas. Our last section then is the pancreatic tail. So the tail is just this last little bit back here. The pancreas tail is going to extend more superior into the body towards the hilum of the spleen. It ends up being kind of sandwiched in between the spleen and the left kidney. And there's actually some transverse colon that comes along here too. So this can also be a very difficult spot to see. If you haven't noticed the pattern yet, the pancreas is a very hard organ to see by ultrasound. Looking at some of the landmarks for the tail then, we're going to see the kidney posterior to it. So we'll see the kidney kind of down here. The aorta is going to be seen more towards the right of the patient. The splenic vein is probably our most prominent landmark. And we're going to see that coursing along the posterior border. So you can see in this picture here, it's on the backside because it's on the posterior. But it comes out of the spleen, kind of wraps around the tail and up towards that portal confluence. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the splenic artery does continue along the tail and into the spleen. When we are imaging the tail on ultrasound, we want to make sure that you increase your depth a little bit. Even though it does angle a little bit more superior into the body, it does dive a little bit deeper into the body as well. So especially when we are transverse on the pancreas, we want to include enough depth so we can see all of the tail. And then here's this image again, just with all of those landmarks that we talked about. If you read through the chart, start on the left side, you would say the unsun process is anterior to the IVC. The unsun process is posterior to the SMV and pancreas. So the first time we presented everything, I told you how the landmarks are in relationship to the pancreas. In this chart, I'm telling you how the pancreas is in relationship to the landmarks. So it's a little bit backwards between the two. You should know how to flip-flop them both ways.
the IVC is posterior to the head of the pancreas. The head is anterior to the IVC. You should know it both ways. Section 5.3, pancreatic ducts. There are two ducts in the pancreas that we need to know about. The first one is the duct of Wurzung, and the second one is the duct of Santorini. Now, the duct of Wurzung is also known as our main pancreatic duct, and that makes sense because it runs all the way from the tail down through the body into the head, joins up with the common bile duct, and then will enter through the ampulla of water into the duodenum. So the duct of Wurzung is the big one. It's the main pancreatic duct. The accessory duct then is also known as the duct of Santorini. And the duct of Santorini does branch off of the main duct, and it is going to have its own entrance into the duodenum, about two centimeters superior to where the ampulla of water enters. So duct of Wurzung is the main pancreatic duct. Duct of Santorini is the smaller accessory duct for the pancreas. Recall then too that at the ampulla of water, we have the sphincter of Odi. Remember that it's going to be the muscle that controls how the bile and pancreatic enzymes enter into the duodenum. Section 5.4, pancreatic vasculature. Now the pancreas is a highly vascularized structure. However, we cannot see most of these blood vessels, and so they hold very little importance to ultrasound in the sense of being able to visualize them and to make any diagnoses off of that. The big two that you need to know are that the gastroduodenal artery is going to supply the head of the pancreas, and the splenic and superior mesenteric artery are going to be responsible for supplying the body and the tail with blood. So remember we have our aorta leaving the heart. One of the big first branches is the celiac axis. The left branch is the splenic artery. The right branch is the common hepatic artery. A common hepatic artery is going to give rise to the gastroduodenal artery. After the gastroduodenal artery branches off, the common hepatic artery turns into the proper hepatic artery as it heads to the liver. But we are going to focus a little bit more on that gastroduodenal artery in relationship to the pancreas head. As the gastroduodenal artery courses inferior across the pancreas head, it's going to give rise to two more branches that are more responsible for supplying the head and the duodenum. And that's going to be the anterior pancreaticoduodenal artery and the inferior pancreaticoduodenal artery. Both the anterior and inferior arteries are going to not only supply the head, but they are going to continue branching over into the duodenum to supply blood flow to the small intestine. Looking at the other side, then the splenic artery is going to mostly head to the spleen, but it also has lots of little branches that are going to come down and perfuse into the pancreas. As far as venous drainage goes for the pancreas, it is performed mostly by the splenic vein. Uh, we do get a little bit of drainage from the superior and inferior mesenteric veins, and all the blood from both of those are going to pool back into the portal vein to be processed by the liver. Section 5.5, variants. Just like with all of our other organs, sometimes the pancreas doesn't get put together quite right, so we do see some anatomical variants. So the first one we'll talk about is called an annular pancreas. Now the annular pancreas is a condition in which a ring of pancreatic tissue surrounds the second portion of the sea loop of the duodenum. So remember in our normal pancreas, our pancreas sat at an angle and the head was just kind of cradled within that sea loop. Well, with the annular pancreas, instead of being cradled within that sea loop, it comes out and around and kind of gives the duodenum a big hug. So if we were to look from it from the top, we'd have the tail and this would be the head here. Normally the head would end at the duodenum in the case of the annular pancreas, it wraps around the duodenum. And that can cause some issues. That can cause some stricture within the duodenum, causing issues of how the stomach empties and how well the intestines work. Next, we have the ectopic pancreas. Ectopic pancreas is also known as a heterotopic or an aberrant pancreas. And basically with this variant, what we'll see is little bits of pancreatic tissue scattered throughout the GI tract. It doesn't have any ductal or vascular connection to the pancreas. It's just kind of its own little blob of pancreas out there. So because these little bits can be very small, it is actually very difficult for ultrasound to diagnose them. But we do have an example of one on the CT here in the red circle. Just a little bit of pancreas tissue that does not connect back to the main part of the pancreas. Next up then we have agenesis. As we've learned with other organs, A means abnormal. Genesis means creation of, so this is the abnormal creation of the pancreas. Now it's really uncommon for all of the pancreas to be missing. 
So typically agenesis is going to present more as a good portion of the pancreas missing. And as this image is showing us, we're actually missing a lot of the dorsal portion of the pancreas. It should kind of be hanging out over here because this is the aorta right here. So we should expect the body and the tail of the pancreas to kind of be hanging out in this area. This is the spleen coming in here. So in this patient in particular, they have their ventral bud, their dorsal bud never formed. And again, it's more common for them to be missing a big part of their pancreas versus missing the whole thing. And lastly, we have the pancreas divisium. Now, pancreas divisium is the most common anomaly that we'll see of the pancreas. Normally, when we are developing, remember we have that ventral bud and we have the dorsal bud. And usually they're going to fuse together to create the entire pancreas and the main pancreatic duct. In the case of pancreas divisium, the dorsal portion and the ventral portion never fuse, causing the dorsal portion to have its own ductal system and then the head or the ventral portion having its own ductal system and being the part that connects with the common bile duct. So in our normal pancreas, usually this blue duct is going to make up most of the main duct. It's going to fuse in with the ventral and that's going to complete the main duct. And then we have that little accessory duct that keeps going into the duodenum. In this case, the whole dorsal duct just does that second opening into the duodenum where the ventral duct is the one that will connect with the common bile duct and enter in through the ampulla vata, they have no connection with one another. Section 5.6, microanatomy. Now the pancreas is responsible for both exocrine and endocrine functions. Therefore, the pancreas is made up of different cell groups that perform these functions. The exocrine function of the pancreas is performed by what we call the acini cells. Now acini means berries in a cluster, are the cells that are connected to the ducts within the pancreas. And these cells are going to produce the digestive enzymes that travel through the ducts to the duodenum. Most of the cells in the pancreas are the acini cells. So looking at our image here, we've got a close-up of the pancreas. So we have a duct coming through here and we can see that it terminates in kind of this cluster of cells. So all of the cells that are connected to the ductal system are called the acini cells. They make up a really big portion of the pancreatic cells. So all of these orangish cells with the purple dots in them represent the acini cells. Now the endocrine function of the pancreas is going to be performed by the cells that are found in the islets of Langerhans. And the islets of Langerhans are going to make up the rest of the cells in the pancreas, really only counting for about 5% of the total volume. So you can see in the middle of these acini cells is this kind of green area, and this is the islet of Langerhans. Within the islet of Langerhans are five more types of cells. We have alpha cells, which I've got represented by the blue, the beta cells being represented by the green, delta cells, which are the pink ones, the gamma cells, which are these yellow ones, and lastly, the epsilon cells, which are the light blue ones. Now the green ones, the beta cells, are the most abundant, making up about 65 to 80% of the islet of Langerhans cells, followed then by the alpha cells. These two types of cells do a lot of the endocrine work that the pancreas is responsible for. The rest of the cells have important work to do as well, but are less abundant within the islets of Langerhans. The other thing we'll see in the islets of Langerhans are a multitude of capillaries. So that's all these little red spots here. Lots of capillaries to grab those hormones and bring them out to the body for circulation. So I've got this picture again with just a little bit more information here. Remember our CNE cells are the ones that are connected to the ducts. They're going to be responsible for digestive enzymes and are part of the exocrine system. So the ducts and the CNE cells are the exocrine part. All the other cells are found in the islets of Langerhans and are all responsible for endocrine function. And we're going to go over this a little bit more in detail in the physiology portion. Section 5.7, physiology. Knowing that the pancreas is an endocrine and exocrine organ, we'll talk about each of its physiological roles separately. The physiology of the pancreas is also more related to systemic disease versus disease that would arise directly from the pancreas, and very few diseases of the pancreas are able to be diagnosed solely by ultrasound. Therefore, we're going to do a very limited discussion of the physiological function of the pancreas. But we're going to start with the exocrine function. The functional unit of the exocrine portion of the pancreas is the acini cells and the ductal system. Remember back to our image, it was the orange cells, the acini cells that were connected to the ducts that we we're talking about. 
Now those acini cells are responsible for making enzymes for digestion, storing those enzymes, and then secreting them when the time comes. The ducts also have an important role in the exocrine function in that when they receive the right hormones, they're going to secrete water or like an aqueous substance that's going to help flush the acini enzymes through the ductal system. The exocrine portion of the pancreas is controlled by what we call the parasympathetic system. That's known as the rest and digest system. It's, it's the part of our nervous system that's kind of taking care of some of those background jobs. And this is opposed to the sympathetic nervous system, which is more of our fight and flight system. Going back to the acini cells, remember I said that they're responsible for creating enzymes. Well, those are the digestive enzymes that the body needs to help break down those macronutrients that we eat. The acini cells are responsible for making amylase, lipase, and proteases. Those proteases are going to include trypsin, chymotrypsogen, and carboxypepsidase. And lastly, they're also responsible for creating bicarbonate. Now, each of those digestive enzymes are going to be responsible for breaking down certain complex macronutrients that we ingest. Amylase is going to break down carbohydrates, lipase is going to break down the fats, and the proteases are going to break down different proteins. So the acini cells in the pancreas are responsible for making these digestive enzymes, but they're also responsible for storing them. And what's kind of interesting is that technically the body is made of these macronutrients that these enzymes are responsible for breaking down. So what the acini cells do is stores these enzymes as zymogens. And these zymogens are kind of inactive enzymes until they become activated in the small intestine. So they hang out safely in the pancreas. And then once we eat and they get released into the duodenum, then they're activated, they kind of lose their shell, and they can break down the food that we eat. So we have a self-protective system so we don't digest ourselves. To get those digestive enzymes into the duodenum though, the acini cells have produced these enzymes and then they're kind of hanging out as zymogens waiting to be secreted. Once they are secreted into the main pancreatic duct, that aqueous substance is going to be flushed through, grabbing those zymogens where they're going to go through the ampulla water and into the duodenum where they can do the job that they need to do on the chyme or the stomach mash that has passed through into the first part of the small intestine. The bicarbonate that the acini cells are responsible for creating is something that is going to neutralize the stomach acid to protect the small intestine. So the stomach has a mucosal lining and its whole job is to hold this hydrochloric acid to help start breaking down our food. Well, the duodenum doesn't have that protective mucosal layer. So as that acidic chyme comes into the duodenum, it recognizes the acidity. Secretin is released from the duodenum, which tells the pancreas to release bicarbonate. And that bicarbonate is going to come in with the digestive enzymes to help neutralize the chyme and make a more basic environment so those digestive enzymes can operate better. So to recap how digestion works between the pancreas and the gallbladder, first things first, just the sight of food is going to make our enzyme production start. When we put that food into our mouth and start mashing it up, our salivary glands are going to produce saliva, and in that saliva is amylase. We're then going to use our muscular tentacle, or tongue, to swallow that food, it's going to go down the esophagus and into the stomach. Now down in the stomach there are specialized cells that create mucus and pepsin and hydrochloric acid and this is all going to help start to break the food down even further. After rolling around in the stomach for a little bit the food is going to pass through the antrum of the stomach and into the duodenum. It is now called chyme. And when that acidic chyme enters the duodenum it's going to activate cells within the duodenum that are going to produce hormones. The two hormones are going to tell the pancreas and the gallbladder to activate. The first one, cholecystokinin, is going to activate the gallbladder to release bile, and it'll activate the acini cells to release their enzymes. A second hormone, secretin, is also going to tell the pancreas to release water and that bicarbonate. So when the cholecystokinin interacts with the gallbladder, that bile is released through the cystic duct, into the common bile duct where it's going to join with the duct of Wurzung. From the pancreas then, through the duct of Wurzung are going to come the amylase, lipase, protease, and bicarbonate, and those are going to join together and enter into the duodenum through the ampulla of water. Once in the duodenum, 
The bile is going to help to emulsify the fat. And once those fats are a little bit smaller, the lipase is going to break them down into even smaller pieces that can be absorbed through the intestinal wall. The amylase and proteases are going to do the same thing, breaking down carbohydrates into glucose and proteins into amino acids. At this point, the exocrine portion of the digestive tract is done and endocrine function is going to pick up now that the food is broken down into their small molecules. So switching over to the endocrine function of the pancreas, remember that the hormones are produced by the cells that are found in the islets of Langerhans. There are six key polypeptide hormones that are secreted by the endocrine pancreas. One of the big hormones that we probably have all heard of is insulin, and that is produced by the beta cells, and that is going to help decrease the blood glucose levels or decrease the sugar in the blood. Another job of the beta cells is to produce amylin. Amylin is going to help the stomach slow down its emptying so it doesn't put too much food into the duodenum, which should prevent spikes in the blood glucose levels. Glucagon is produced by the alpha cells and that's going to increase blood glucose levels. If we haven't eaten for a little bit and the body needs more energy, remember that the liver is storing glycogen and when that glucagon is released into the blood, that glycogen is released from the liver so it can increase the blood glucose levels. The delta cells are responsible for releasing somatostatin and that's going to help kind of control some of the other things that happen in the islets of Langerhans. The gamma cells are responsible for pancreatic polypeptides which also kind of controls some of the GI function and then the epsilon cells release ghrelin, which really doesn't have a strong purpose as far as scientists can tell. The best thing they can tell is that it helps to increase our appetite. So when the body recognizes that there is low fuel amounts, the epsilon cells will release the ghrelin and kind of make us a little bit hungry, so we'll give the body some more food. At the end of the digestion recap, I had stated that the endocrine system is going to take over after the food is digested into those small molecules. So we're going to take a look at what happens at the cellular level with digestion and hormones. We'll pick up the final steps of digestion then in the GI tract unit. When we eat carbohydrates, we are basically eating sugar. So carbohydrates are basically all those OS molecules, lactose, glucose, all of that. And when the body absorbs the broken down carbs, the most simple form of carbohydrates or sugar is glucose. And when we increase the blood sugar levels, that is called hyperglycemia. Increased glucose or hyperglycemia is going to stimulate the beta cells to release insulin and the alpha cells to stop making glucagon. Now that insulin being in the blood is going to tell cells around the body to do different things. The fat cells are going to be told to take in sugar and make more fat, which is called lipogenesis. The muscle cells are going to be told to take in sugar and make glycogen, and that's called glycogenesis. It's also going to be, they're also going to be told to make proteins because now they have the energy to do it. And then lastly, the liver cells are going to be told to stop making sugar for the body, start making glycogen, and make more fat. So in the little GIF on below, you can see that the insulin comes in, sits on a little door kind of key receptor on the cell, which opens up the door for the sugars to come in. The sugars come in from the blood into the cell, so the cell can use them for energy to do their jobs. So insulin's main job is to tell the cells to bring that sugar inside the cell because there's work to do, and by doing so, all of these functions are going to lower the blood sugar. Now when we don't eat, because we're in a time of fasting, so we have no energy coming in, or maybe we're exercising, expending a lot of energy, the cells are still going to need sugar to do their job. If we haven't eaten, or if we've used all the sugar that's in the blood, the blood now has low sugar and low sugar in the blood is called hypoglycemia. And when the body is in a state of hypoglycemia, it is going to activate the alpha cells of the pancreas to release their glucagon. And glucagon is also going to tell the beta cells that there's going to be some work to do soon because the body's gonna get ready to send some more sugar out and the only way that sugar can get into the cells is with that insulin from the beta cells. So the glucagon goes out into the body and talks to a bunch of cells again. Again, the liver cells are going to be told to convert glycogen to glucose, so that's glycogenolysis, and they're going to be told to make sugar out of ketones, 
which is gluconeogenesis. Those fat cells are going to be told to break down and send ketones to the liver so the liver can make that sugar. And then the muscles are also going to convert glycogen to glucose. The presence of glucagon in the body tells the cells that are responsible for making sugar out of their storages to release that sugar. And therefore, glucagon tells the cells to do things that will all raise blood sugar. Now, there were a bunch of other hormones that we talked about right at the beginning, too. I kind of briefly described which each of them did. This is all in your workbook if you want to read through it a little bit closer. Basically, amylin is also secreted by the beta cells, and it helps to tell the stomach to, like, don't put too much food into the system. We're not quite ready to handle all of that sugar. It's supposed to help kind of act as a satiety agent as well, telling the person that they're full. Somatostatin, then, is released by the delta cells. And these are going to kind of affect how the rest of the endocrine organs produce their hormones. So the gastrointestinal tract, the pancreas, and the adrenal glands are all kind of affected by the somatostatin. It's basically saying we've eaten, we've got some stuff to do, start making your hormones. The pancreatic polypeptides are produced by the gamma cells in the pancreas. And they become active when we're kind of getting to the end of eating. And there isn't as much work to do in the intestines. So the pancreatic polypeptides tell the gallbladder to stop releasing bile, stop the pancreas from releasing pancreatic juices, and then tells the intestines that, you know, we're kind of done with our job. We can slow down absorption. And lastly, that ghrelin is produced by the epsilon cells. Not a whole lot of understanding about what ghrelin does, but the best thing that we figured out is that ghrelin is there to increase appetite when our stomach is empty. Section 5.8, pancreas chemistry. So just like with our other organs, we do want to evaluate the lab tests that can help us to identify any sort of pancreas malfunction. And the two big ones that we're going to look at are amylase and lipase. If you recall, amylase and lipase were both digestive enzymes that were produced by the acini cells. And when there's a lot of amylase in the blood, it's usually because there's some sort of blockage in the pancreas causing that amylase to spill out into the bloodstream. And this is usually due to pancreatitis. So pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas. Usually when somebody presents with pancreatitis, we can treat it and they'll get better within a few days. But multiple bouts of acute pancreatitis can turn into chronic pancreatitis. And then we have a whole different set of issues. So pancreatitis will be discussed much more in detail when we start to talk about pathology. Now increased lipase, same idea. There's probably pancreatitis. And that's, again, because lipase is produced by the acini cells. Something is causing the pancreas to malfunction and release those enzymes into the blood instead of releasing them into the ducts. Lipase and amylase are both functions of the exocrine side of the pancreas. To test the endocrine function of the pancreas, blood glucose levels are going to be the most useful. So we are testing sugar in the blood, and that'll tell us how well the pancreas is releasing insulin to counteract that sugar. As far as hormones for the other cells in the islets of Langerhans, we do see that if any of those hormones are high or in excess, it usually means that there's a tumor made of those cells releasing extra hormone. However, insulin is probably one of the bigger ones that we are concerned about because higher than normal glucose levels are going to mean a higher risk for developing diabetes. Now we can't diagnose diabetes just on an ultrasound, but diabetes has a really big effect on the rest of the body. And sometimes that can cause pathology in other organs. For example, we might see plaque in the arteries. We might start to see other cancers around the body. Liver disease is very common with diabetes as well as kidney disease. As usual, we're going to wrap up our anatomy, physiology, and ultrasound lecture with the normal appearance of the organ by ultrasound. So let's go ahead with section 5.9, normal appearance of the pancreas. When you see the pancreas by ultrasound, it should be more echogenic than the liver. Remember, kids love soda pop. Pop is the pancreas. It should be the most echogenic organ. And we also want it to be homogenous and smooth and echo texture. We can see in this image here, we have the uncinate process, the pancreas head, neck, body, and tail. Comparing the pancreas tissue to the liver, we can see that the pancreas is more echogenic, like it should be. It's also very smooth in echo texture and homogenous, meaning that it's all kind of the same green, the same level of gray. 
Now the tail and the head of the pancreas don't always sit in the same plane, so you might need more than one image that's going to focus on the head and neck, and one that focuses on the body and tail. Remember that the head and neck sits a little bit more inferior into the body and is covered by peritoneum. So the head of the pancreas is considered peritoneal, but on the whole, the pancreas is considered a retroperitoneal organ. That tail is going to be more superior into the body. And then as we can see in this picture here, it dives a little bit more posterior. Because of the positioning of the stomach and the duodenum, it's not uncommon that the pancreas, especially the tail and body, are obscured by gas. Whenever you can use that liver as a window, you kind of angle through the liver tissue down to the pancreas tissue, you're going to have a much better chance of seeing pancreatic tissue. Recall back to our liver lecture, we talked about how some people don't really have a left lobe of the liver. Those tend to be harder people to see the pancreas on. If you're struggling to see the pancreas though, you always want to take a look for your vascular landmarks. We can usually see the midline vascular structures very well. Remember the uncinant process is sandwiched in between the IVC and the SMV, which is not pictured here. The head is going to have the GDA in it and the common bile duct in it. It's also going to be anterior to the IVC. The neck of the pancreas is just anterior to the portal confluence. The body of the pancreas is going to be left lateral to the superior mesenteric artery and the aorta. And then we'll see the tail being wrapped by the splenic vein on the posterior side. So again, this is all pancreatic tissue. And then we can see all those major landmarks surrounding to help us identify where the pancreas is. And we can also look for those landmarks in the longitudinal plane. So if we have the IVC in long, we know that we should be able to see the pancreas head just anterior to it. If we can see the portal confluence, we know we should be able to see the pancreas neck. So this is all pancreas in the longitudinal plane anterior to the IVC. Same idea if we have the aorta. We know that we should be getting into pancreas body over here. Again, we can see the portal confluence. We can see the splenic artery. We know that this is all pancreas sandwiched in between the liver and the aorta. This example is a great example of showing us how it can be kind of difficult to see the pancreas. This is a fatty pancreas, so it's a little bit more echogenic than what we would expect, but this shows nicely the stomach kind of overlying the tail and body of the pancreas. The transverse colon also comes across here, so that can obscure the tail quite a bit. And then the duodenum sits right around the head, and that can obscure the head quite a bit. So this is why we want our patients to be NPO or nothing by mouth. We want to give us the best chance of not having that pancreas obscured if possible. But we can use our portal confluence as a landmark. We have the aorta as a landmark to help us identify where that pancreatic tissue is. As far as measuring the pancreas, we don't typically measure the pancreas, but if it looks kind of big to your dermatist and you want to measure it, you should find that the measurements of the pancreas are less than three centimeters in the AP dimension at any point. So notice in the chart down here, nothing is bigger than three centimeters. The head and the body are the thickest parts. Uh, everything else should be less than that three. Again, we don't typically measure the total length of the pancreas. If you wanted to, you could typically in the 12 to 18 centimeter range. Oftentimes just imaging the pancreas enough, you'll start to kind of get a feel for what a normal pancreas size looks like. And it'll be easier the more that you do to recognize a pancreas that is on the larger side. Sometimes you will be able to see the duct of Wurzung going through the middle of the pancreas. You do want to make sure that you use color on it because the splenic artery can also kind of mimic the duct of Wurzung. So put color on, if it doesn't fill in, then it's most likely the duct, and then you'll want to measure it. Many ducts that measure more than two millimeters in the pancreas are considered abnormal. Make sure too that you don't get confused with the gastroduodenal artery and the common bile duct. Remember, those are gonna be more in transverse in the pancreas head. The gastroduodenal artery is the more anterior spot and should fill with color, but the common bile duct is the more posterior spot at the head and should not fill with color. 
Again, these are more into the head where the duct of Worsung is going to be visualized and long through the body of the pancreas. Let's wrap up this lecture then with talking a little bit more about the pancreas protocol in section 5.10. So the pancreas is typically included in the right upper quadrant ultrasound and the abdomen complete ultrasound. Depending on your facility, it may or may not be part of the liver ultrasound protocol. However, there are multiple indications for ordering an exam that includes the pancreas. Those are going to include getting measurements of the pancreas, if another imaging modality showed that it was large, looking for masses that involve the pancreas itself or the biliary tree, looking for any sort of obstruction along the biliary or pancreatic ductal path, using ultrasound to diagnose and to follow up acute or chronic pancreatitis, again, diagnosing or following up pancreatic pseudocysts, which are pockets of digestive enzymes outside of the pancreas, we can also perform endoscopic pancreatic ultrasounds in the event that we saw something with a transabdominal ultrasound. They go to CT and the CT results don't tell us a whole lot. We can go in with an endoscope and perform an ultrasound from inside the esophagus. So speaking of the esophageal ultrasound, first we usually start with that transabdominal and that's going to just be using one of our curved linear probes or possibly a vector probe using a lower frequency because that is the transducer that we are using for most of our abdominal work. Now that transesophageal ultrasound means inserting an ultrasound camera into the esophagus and lowering it to the level of the pancreas. So here we have that example. This is the ultrasound head. This is inside the esophagus and this is the pancreas tissue right next to it. Here is the splenic vein and the portal confluence. So we can see that pancreas parenchyma in so much more detail because we are right next to it. Patients are typically sedated for these. These usually are not performed within the general ultrasound department and are performed by a specially trained doctor with the endoscope transducers. Patient prep for the pancreas is going to follow right along with what we've been doing for abdomen already, which typically means NPO or nothing by mouth for six to eight hours. To position the patient, the pancreas is typically visualized best with the patient on their back. However, you can get possibly a little bit more visualization if you try sitting the patient up a little bit. Remember with that left lobe of the liver being directly superior to the pancreas, by sitting them up a little bit, it can kind of cause that liver to flop down. And now we can use the liver as a little bit more of a window to visualize the pancreas. Remember that breathing can also change the positioning of the organs. And so you should always try multiple techniques to visualize the pancreas when possible. Some other scanning tips that I've got for you here are also in your workbook, so make sure to take a read through them. I think the biggest ones that I go through quite often with new scanners is that you really want to use that liver as a window. Position your transducer above the left lobe of the liver, and then you're going to angle through the liver and down towards the patient's feet to image the pancreas. If you think about getting your trans left lobe image, the pancreas is typically right below it and in that picture. So try that window when trying to visualize the pancreas. Remember to use enough pressure in this area as well. There's a lot of bowel in the area. So you wanna make sure that you're kind of pushing that bowel out of the way so you can get closer to the pancreatic anatomy because it does sit a little bit deeper into the body. As far as protocol goes, there's not a whole lot to it. Again, not all facilities are going to have the same protocol, but in general, you need a picture of the pancreas while in the transverse plane on the body. So quite often we label it transverse pancreas, even though we have the pancreas completely elongated out. If the head and neck and body and tail do not sit well enough in the same plane to get a good diagnostic picture, it's okay to take a focused picture at the body and tail and a focused picture at the head and neck. What I have found that works out best is to have the notch of the transducer at the nine o'clock position to image the head and neck, so a true transverse. And then when you want the body and tail, you're going to slightly oblique, turning the notch down to the seven o'clock position to elongate that tail, because you'll remember that the pancreas sits obliquely in the body. So we wanna elongate that tail by also obliquing our transducer. If you do need to find longitudinal pictures of the pancreas as well, remember your landmarks being over the IVC shows you the head of the pancreas where being over the aorta is going to show you more of the 
body and tail, and as you move lateral towards the patient's left, you should come into even more tail of the pancreas. And that brings us to the end of our pancreas lecture. So we've covered normal anatomy, physiology, and ultrasound appearance. Make sure to go through the activities in your workbook and the open-ended nerd check questions to help you evaluate how well you can recall the information presented. There are tons of pictures on the internet, not only diagrams of the pancreas, but ultrasound images of the pancreas. Look through the variety of images that are out there. The more you can present to yourself for studying, the better off you will be when for whatever you get on your tests or on your boards. And just keep practicing visualizing that pancreas. The more you look for it, the more comfortable you're going to be able identifying it.